I want to talk about this. This is courtesy of RA regarding revenue sharing platform A Slice, which was partly owned by the DJ DVS1, which I'm sure I've spoken about here numerous times, and I'm sure you've probably seen it on YouTube numerous times also. Unfortunately, it's due to close. Unfortunately, A Slice, the revenue sharing platform, is due to close. Unfortunately. It says, launched by DVS1 in 2002, the company shared over 422,000 of its earnings with more than 27,000 producers. It says here, courtesy of RA, ASIS is closing. A revenue sharing platform broke the news in a statement published today, um, September 3rd. The team thanked the friends, DJs, producers, and partners and advisors for showing that a better future for possible is possible through a collective action. Launched in 2002, um, ASIS um, operated a donation-based system where DJs pledged a percentage of their gig fee to the producers whose music they played. Across two years, the service gathered 7,400 playlists with 935 um, DJs who collectively shared $422,000 of their earnings with more than 27,000 producers around the world. As part of the closing process, A Slice underwent an external review courtesy of data analysts from Audio Strategies the resulting report, a size of fairness, proved that you don't need deep pockets or huge teams to change the world, according to the audience strategies, David Boyle. They've set a new benchmark for fairness and respect. Their impact will echo for years to come. Now it's up to the industry to build a foundation they lay. The question now is, who will pick up the torch? The report also highlighted the financial sustainability challenges that ultimately led to a size's closure, which is the most important one. The annual operational cost amounted to roughly $250,000 while the platform made just 63000 during its time in business. Browse Instagram for more information and read the slice of fairness below to find out what's going on. Um, so basically, in short, just to give you in short, um, it was a really good platform, I feel like. The idea behind it was really cool by, D by DJ DBS1. Essentially, he was looking to find a way to allow producers of these tunes that some of these DJs play in these big clubs to get paid. Because as you guys know, most DJs don't play their own songs. They play songs from various other people in clubs. Some of the biggest DJs in the world get some crazy fees and what they pay for. So the system is a bit imbalanced because the people that make the tunes don't get paid as much as some of the biggest DJs. So DVS1 went to fix that by saying, hey, if you play a bunch of gigs, maybe portion some of your gig fee to the producers so that everyone can kind of get paid for doing this work you get paid as a big dj they also get paid for making the music and make people dance at the club so on paper really good idea but obviously this required voluntary sign up and voluntary um agreements from people in the scene dj specifically and if you look at it really and truly this probably needed more support from the top echelon tier one a side djs than the ones who are below they're the ones that really need to buy into it. If they bought into it, it would have made a big difference, but they didn't buy into it. So really and truly, it was most of the, what you, what I would like to call like the working class, blue collar, you know, check to check fucking DJs that are probably propping up the entire thing, which is obviously unfair because they're the ones who are not making the most, they're probably making the least out of everybody um, who DJs out there. Um, but obviously it was a really good program. So, you know, props in for doing so. But there's been a lot of talk about it online. I recently watched a video of the legend um, Richie Horton talking about it also. He said some really, you know, poignant things on there. Took a while to get through it because he was pausing every two minutes. Like, it felt like I was listening to Lex Friedman. I love fucking, you know, I love uh, Richie Horton. And maybe because I'm a big yapper and I talk too fast, but legitimately, like, he was pausing between every word, like, Lex Friedman. It took fucking ages. It felt like that 10-minute clip felt like half an hour. He said a lot of good stuff, but, you know, me being the contrarian that I am, I need to push back on a few things. So, because I'm a stickler for like extreme ownership big up Jocko Wilnick I think extreme ownership is the main way to go about doing things so when I read this particular blurb on this website and it tells me that the operational cost to run a slice was 250,000 I think to myself that's probably too much there's definitely a way that you could run that platform that service for far less than 250,000 you have to find a way and if you can't find a way to run that for less than 250000 then maybe you have to allow ads on the site to maybe offset some of that money for the operational cost, right? You have to figure out a way. Either you kind of figure out a way to run it for cheap or you increase the ads or maybe you increase the fucking percentages um, that DJ have to give back to the producers, maybe take some of the percentages and use that as a commission to pay off some of the fee. But you have to figure that out. So that's some of the things that obviously didn't make any sense. 
I also think, in my opinion, this is my opinion. Again, I'm not a numbers guy, B. But I think to only have divvied out, in my opinion, to only have divvied out $422,000 since 2022 is proof that the, there was enough people that opted in for it. That's not enough money. Considering the amount of DJs who play year in, year out, weekend in, weekend out, festivals of all over the world, 422000 is just not lot. It's not a lot of money. And it's not enough money to divvy out to a bunch of people either. You know, you can't really rely on this, right? This is not, nothing in the grand scheme of things. So obviously, that's a big concern. But I also think the criticism of some of the A-star DJs and the top DJs who didn't opt into this service or this platform is a bit unfair. Because I think, for myself anyway, my the, the veil from my eyes was removed about this whole idea that this is a scene and this is a community. I may I may use them as like descriptors, you know, whatever, just to kind of describe what I'm talking about. But are, are, are we really in a scene? Are we really in a community? I don't think so. We never have been. And I think the veil was pulled over my eyes when, or removed from my eyes when COVID happened. And when the playgraves were going on, the majority of the DJs who were playing those playgraves weren't working class DJs or middle tier DJs. These are the top DJs who you would think could afford taking a year off. Because, you know, most of us are, you know, we're, we're sensible people. We're grown-ups. We know most of these people make a bunch of money. Some of us have probably heard some big DJs getting paid like 50000 per sets and stuff. So if that's the case, and they're getting paid 50000 per sets, and it's usually a team of one person, maybe a manager, maybe an agent. After you divvy up the money, they're still getting 30k from that 50. So it's like, do you really need to play a playgrave? Are you really that hurting for money? Or are you just playing it because, you know, you want all the money? You're just, you know, you're essentially what I like to always describe DJs as like the the CEOs of like hedge funds, essentially, when it comes to dance music. They want all the money all the time and everybody else can go get fucked. So that was that's basically how it is. And I personally like to operate in the world as it is, as opposed to try to operate in a world that doesn't exist. So if the world is as it is, and most DJs are capitalists and they don't give a fuck about anybody else. And they're very kind of selfish and one track minded. And even look at some of the DJs, some of the big DJs, they don't really bring in people. Like I can't really think of a lot of big, big DJs who have brought someone in, put their arm around their shoulder and say, hey, these two people are the next ones up. I'm going to be taking them on tour together. Like it's just all about them. Unless they have a label and they want to bring people up there. It just doesn't work out that way. So they're very selfish. They've always have been. So if that's the case and they're very selfish and always have been, you probably have to create a system that doesn't give them any choice but to donate. Maybe the system gives them points or puts them on a particular pedestal or is this, like there has to be something that kind of maybe it's a force come in it's a force fucking opt in at certain clubs. Something gets you know seg you know some of the fee goes out to the producers. If that doesn't happen, the news gets leaked and then you get fucking publicly shamed and they have to go back on their word. That's the only way. But you don't get you can't make the big tier DJs opt in something like this. They're never going to opt in. They are never, ever going to work opt in. So I think in this particular case, maybe there was too much faith put in the community and the DJ and the scene in general that people would do the quote unquote right thing. Because as, as it proved during the playgraves, no one does the right thing. Everyone does the right thing for them. They're not doing the right thing for the community or the scene. They're doing the right thing for them in that particular moment. They're only looking out for themselves which is fine. I also think it's really unfair to expect a DJ to fucking save or, you know, rescue or to rebuild the music industry that's broken. I've always said it's very unfair that artists in general have to rely on doing other things apart from just making great art to survive. Why can't a producer who makes a banging record that then gets played at all these amazing events just be able to survive and live off the success of that record? Every producer now has to think, okay, once I make this banging record and it goes kind of fucking crazy, I have to think of a way to kind of perform this as a live act, as a DJ. Everyone has to do this. On the flip side, DJs also, there's a ceiling for a lot of DJs. About, okay, cool. I'm DJing. I'm doing a good job with it. People think I'm great. They pay me. I get booked to all these places. But the next level up is I have to produce a song. So now you're encroaching in the area where people are really good at producing and they're not getting paid. And now you, the big DJ who's getting paid anyway a lot of money, but you want more money because you're a DJ capitalist, you are now encroaching on their space to learn how to produce. You might even use them to ghost produce. And then, of course, you're taking up more room. And then, boom, you take up all the fucking money and there's none left over for them. 
So the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem, I think, I think lies within the industry itself, the business, the mechanics of it. That needs to be fixed. The percentages, how they, how it gets divvied up, streams. And maybe as well, I was actually thinking about it earlier on in the shower. Maybe you have to blame a lot of these fucking publications, the RAs, the Mixmat, all these sort of places, especially Resident Advisor. I've always said Resident Advisor should really think about reintroducing DJ polls again. Because I feel like DJ polls could be a weird way to kind of fix what's going on. Hang on with me. I remember back in the day when the RA DJ polls were really popping, one of the reasons why they were great was because it only allowed you to vote on events that you'd been to. So most of the time, if you lived in a, you know, in a metropolitan city like I did and you go out a lot, most of your ticket purchases were done through RA. So you were going out to random nights all the time throughout the year and seeing people play, having a good time. So if you could only vote for the things that you actually went to, you sometimes ended up voting for DJs that weren't the headliners. Maybe you went to Fold one time and you saw someone open and you're like, oh shit, that, that girl, that guy, they're sick. I'm going to vote for them. And then maybe you start, you know, without realizing, following them around the country and seeing them play in other places. And suddenly the person that you rate on the local level would now enter the top 100 DJ list. Now that builds up their profile. And who knows, that person might be a small producer, but it also creates a bit of parity in the scene. But of course, RA, in my opinion, I think they buckled and they crumbled to the power and the influence and the pressure of labels and shit and agencies. Because if I remember correctly, DRA got rid of that poll because DJ was starting to complain. And it was starting to affect people's mental health. Not fucking legit. Not fucking real. Go fuck off. Do some push-ups. But all that, it started to affect people's mental health. It started to get, it started to affect people's standings in record labels. It started to affect probably the fees that they were getting and shit. And they kind of buckled to that pressure. But I think the DJ poll, although some of the people that were in the top 50 were the same names... I think the actual 100 list, plus the comments, because I remember when I, used to, when I used to be obsessed with RA DJ polls, I used to love reading the comments because there'll be tons of people saying, oh my God, I don't agree with this list. This person should be in there. I'm from this place. This person should be in there. So you'd get recommended so many local people that you would never have heard of. Obviously, nowadays, we get to hear a lot of these local talents and local heroes with streaming platforms like Whore and Boiler Room and all these other platforms existing, right? It's very rare you're going to, you know, look. It's very rare that you're not going to hear about some crazy talented DJ, right? You're, if they're good, they're going to get in front of you one way or the other through some streaming platform. But I think those DJ polls would be a good way to sort of like address the imbalance in the industry where all the money goes to the top people and then all the top people are relied to fucking fund and support the bottom. Where I feel like if you divvy out the money across the field, it makes it a little bit more easy to manage. And then maybe a platform like ASAS can, can survive more because you have more money spread across the field spread across the field more people are willing to opt in and then maybe that social pressure would then lead to the people at the top also opting in that also could be a thing but i think fundamentally 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 the music industry needs to be fixed in terms of how money is divvied up and how people get paid because i don't think it's fair that a producer that knows how to use ableton and all this shit and fruity loops should be also required to be a fucking marketing genius or know how to use social media or turn themselves into an artist, or become an, you know, or, or, or go mysterious mode and try and build up some hype, or start a DJ. If you're good at producing, stick to producing. If you got a DJ, stick to DJing. We just need to fix the mechanics around how these people are getting paid, and then maybe platforms like A-Slice will need to exist anyway, because that's getting pushed. On the other side of things, I'm thinking, maybe, maybe there's an issue with how dance music is consumed. Because I was thinking about myself, and I'm a DJ, and I'm an avid person fan of the scene and shit i go out i go to these nights and shit but i can say hand on heart i have to be honest here i have to be honest say hand on heart i think i've probably purchased legitimately tunes from a beat port a juno um a band camp i think i might purchase songs from there i can count them maybe on both hands the times i purchased legit songs most of my stuff is done you know, by illegal methods. So even I'm not even purchasing the songs per, in the, that way. But I also don't know where the main platform is to kind of view what new songs are coming out. You have to go to different individual record stores, Hardwax, Juno, this, that, that, Fonica to check out all the songs, right? I don't really know. And also, 
there's a lack of reporting when it comes to first week sales to kind of really maybe in a way i wouldn't like encourage the customer and the listener to back and support their favorite artist like there's not really a platform that posts first week sales in dance music electronic music techno whatever you don't really see it i know the numbers won't be great but i think maybe that might help to encourage a lot of the fans to go out and purchase music because i also don't know because maybe i'm different but when i'm supporting an, a, 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 a producer an artist that i like i go and watch them perform even if it's a live show like if i like somebody like let's say renee wise for instance he puts out an ep obviously i'm gonna get it on apple music and shit but i'm also really paying like 9.99 for my apple music subscription right so i'm he, i don't know how much of that 9.99 a month renee wise is getting out of me but I feel like the way that I can support him directly is to go and watch him play at places. And obviously later on, if he puts out merch and shit, I'll buy that as well. But I kind of support my favorite producers and DJs by going to see them perform or maybe watch a live stream of theirs, which again, doesn't really help because, you know, but you know, you think it does because you contribute to the views. The views might contribute to them clout, attention, and then they might be able to increase their DJ fee or get more bookings off the back of it. So maybe it's cyclical. Maybe it is. But I feel like maybe if there was more of a place or go-to spot for that kind of reportage of like oh this ep sold this amount of much in fucking first week sales maybe it would in the weird way encourage fans to kind of support their favorite artists to ensure that they still keep making music i don't know either way i feel like even though devious one has proved one person can change the industry i feel like fundamentally maybe the business side of things wasn't down packed correctly to kind of make it run without it kind of bleeding money which is why it probably had to stop over time and also i don't think it generated enough money in the time that it was around to really justify its existence if anything um but i think the real problem is that the industry itself needs to take a look a sh you know a, a long hard look in the mirror about how it's fucking structured and functioned because at the moment it is only weighted into supporting the top you know 50 to 100 yes the top 50 to 100 do account for the majority of the ticket sales i understand that side of things but if you want to have everybody in the scene getting paid and again it doesn't mean everyone's going to get paid what carl cox gets paid but because carl cox gets paid the majority of what most people get paid everyone else gets has to fight for scraps there's people out here legit djs that you've known of that you've heard of that you're fans of who are playing for free there's djs out here who are legitimately buying tickets paying for their own accommodation to play at cool parties because it looks good on your quote unquote you know instagram dj cv just to, just for the look when really they should be getting paid you know but they're not because most of the fee is going to the headliner so that's the problem that we have at the moment so i think if that doesn't get addressed then all these systems that are coming in from people all these structures all these platforms they're gonna fall by the wayside because you're asking people to voluntarily opt in for things and most of us are selfish most people especially we've seen over the years with djs like again playgrave being a good example the playgrave era was a fucking great example most of us had to sit down by force we were forced to sit down and take time out and not go out and not fucking quote unquote spread this virus around some of us couldn't deal with staying inside so we went to parties and raved and did our thing cool and we were playing fucking songs from our laptop and trying to take our minds off all the misery and all the numbers going up and up and up about covid deaths fine but there were some djs some of the top djs that you know of who were playing in third world countries because they had lax sort of like regulations and you know um stipulations around covid and shit and measures so they were taking advantage of that and going and playing these places you know in front of hundreds of thousands of people while the rest of us were having to kind of you know just figure it out as we went along so for me that was proof that those motherfuckers don't care like they all, all they care about is their wallet in their pocket which is you know the way the, the the fucking scene is set up in a way because look at platforms like ra they won't post you know certain misgivings of certain artists if they're on certain labels because they're in bed with certain labels they're in bed with certain management companies they're better certain booking i mean it's all a bit scammy and weird and odd and corrupt and morally bankrupt anyway so let's not be too surprised that some of the most highest you know grossing djs in the world um didn't want to voluntarily opt into something you know to give producers money that's not really their place if anything it's not really their place to do that the structure of the music industry should be sorted to accommodate for that anyway but you know djs shouldn't be kind of forced into or not forced they shouldn't be obliged to donate to help people you know what i mean it's not gonna happen do you remember during the playground i forgot, I forgot it was was it jamie jones or seth Troxler? some of those djs i think some of those tech house lot djs right 
who I'm disappointed by because I usually look up to these guys coming up. Some of these guys' managers had GoFundMe's. Some of these guys' managers had GoFundMe's. So imagine, this is Seth Troxler. This is Jamie Jones. These are all these big people who probably get paid like 30 grand per gig to play in places who have been around for fucking decades have managers who because of like a year of like non-action in a scene 18 months they had to resort to fucking GoFundMe when really and truly you'd imagine if you're the manager of a a Seth Shocks and shit you should be able to you know Seth Shocks should be able to afford to keep your head above water really especially for the fee that they're getting but again the DJ fees majority go to the DJ and rightfully so they've earned it they play the music they've worked hard cool congratulations but to expect that person who won't even give their manager they won't even allow their manager to you know a living wage or something that would uh, you know account for them not having to take a year out to expect that person who can't even afford to keep their manager's head above water to then give some random producer the money is come on it's, it's unrealistic so it's unfortunate that it's not around anymore it really is but I do think, in general, the music industry needs to be fixed and it shouldn't be up to one person to try and fix that. It should be an industry-wide thing. And I would love to see things like the DJ poll come back because I feel like that would encourage people to go out and see their local heroes more, vote for them, maybe champion them, maybe eventually see them break the top 10, become number one. And then that can kind of, you know, I think, evenly distribute some of the hype and attention across the board so it's not only dedicated to the same 50, 100 people that we all fucking are annoyed by. But again, what do I know? Absolutely nothing.